This is the DRF Players Podcast. Here are your hosts, Peter Thomas Fornatel and Jonathan Kinchin. Hello and welcome to the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatel, back with you. This is the Tuesday, February 20th. 2018 edition. I've lost track of the show numbers. <laughs> I think I've gotten them wrong about three shows in a row. I'm not going to bother. I promise I'll get it right next time. Uh, coming to you once again from the phone booth, JK, my lucky spot here in the Langham Hotel in Pasadena. I am joined not in the adjoining phone booth, but back at a different planet, the planet Texas. He's the people's champion, Jonathan Skinchin. What's up, JK? Hey, do you, do you miss me? Or like, is it not, I do miss you. I do. It's a little sad. You know what I mean? It, it's it's uh, you're used to going to the same place with the same person and that person's off somewhere else. And now it's just you and your computer and your phone. And it's it's just not the same without you, man. Yeah, it's it's a tough life out there in California, Pete. Uh, I'm sure Brooklyn will be happy to get you back today. I'm very excited to head back. Now, it, it's been great out here. It's been such a fun trip. Definitely collecting some information for the uh, the horse racing lifestyle show that we're going to be doing. Let's tell folks about that. Well, you you want to break down what the idea is? Yeah, essentially, it's just to talk about all the fun uh, food, drink, hangout spots that uh, we've grown to love in various uh, race racetrack situations. Uh, some Lexington stuff. I'm sure some Saratoga stuff. Some uh, some wise guy tips, like we like to call them. Uh, places to eat, drink, and hang out. And it, it might wait until that, that dull period. We have so much uh, hardcore racing stuff coming up for the next few months. It might wait until that break between Christmas and New Year's next year. But I, then again, I don't know if it can wait that long. People are always asking questions ahead of meetings. And uh, if we have a dull, if we have a week where we don't have much going on, um, maybe we'll sneak it in earlier. But, but stay tuned. Another way in which I've uh, you know, sort of made a career at this point, ripping off my friend over at Visa and Gil Alexander and things he does on his show and the, the Beating the Book podcast. For example, uh, the Tales from the Track segment directly lifted from story time with Gil and Chris Andrews. And they do an annual lifestyle pod about Las Vegas, always must listen stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll try to do that at some point. We'll bring in some special guests. You think Jake Ballas will come on to talk to us, JK? Uh, the, the Prince of Keeneland is always up to talk, uh, to talk about things, uh, going on in, in the world of, of the social world of racing. He has some special insider knowledge that he might be willing to share with our listeners. Um, so we'll, we'll he, see if he, we can get the Prince involved. The, the Prince is a, is a, he's a big fan of the sports bar. That's, that's his thing. He, he enjoys the sports bar. He enjoys bringing his laptop to the sports bar and then making them put up VG. And then he just likes <laughs> out there. I, I, and and uh, that's his, his thing. So if he can find that's, a good one, he'll he'll find it. That's the move, apparently. But uh, we did get one bit of constructive criticism uh, on the machine, JK, with something to us. Do, do you guys talk about any tournaments on the podcast anymore? Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Are you still complaining after J.K. comes through with a 21 to one winner last weekend? Uh, talk about uh, the recap for the folks what our listeners should have been participating in. Well, you know, I mean, I don't think it's red boarding, but because if well, for there's a real real reason why it's not red boarding, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, no, I mean, I just think that like you know that's one of the angles that I've picked up on with Timeform US and 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 the way that Timeform is laid out. Um, you know, Formulator does it as well. It's a few more clicks than it is on time form, but you can click and see what, what horses, if, if a horse gets a particularly high figure, you can look and see what, what the horses behind that horse in the previous race have done since to have a better idea if that figure was uh, elevated or, or if it was uh, right on time. And, 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 uh, and in this situation, um, what the Bravazo, I believe is the name of the horse, the, the horse is. Um, the, the, the four horses that had come out of that race that had run back already had all improved on an average of 10 points. And those are the types of horses I like to, uh, to play. The horse was eight to one morning line. I had no idea the horse was going to go off at 21 to one, according to Twitter, everyone liked the horse. So it's, it's a little bit, um, tricky to me, but I guess that, that, I think that happens in these derby preps. And we talked about it last week a little bit. It's like, you know, we fall in love with these 
bounces at these mile and mile and a 16th flashy performances. And we forget that there's other three-year-olds that are improving. And, um, and, and, and that appears to be what happened in that situation. Yeah, nice winner there. And uh, But don't go crazy, folks. Don't think he's some long shot player now. He also gave out four to five Monomo Girl on the same day. Bang, bang, huh? Yeah, yeah but, uh, too bad Monomo Girl. I think we, we joked that. I don't think she was connected. Uh, maybe in a pick three she might have been connected. Um, uh, but there's a, a money-making opportunity there. And you made a, a valid point in defense of yourself about Monomo Girl. You know, obviously, hey, look. I have no problem with anybody giving out winners to me. I, I, if they're horses, especially as horizontal players, and you can key your action around them, that's uh, that's a okay with me. I, I just you know make fun because of your uh, your reputation for the low end of the odd spectrum. But in truth, your real opinion in the race was, I, I would say, as much as it was pro Monomoy, it was anti Wonder Godot, who. You know, if you can be playing against with every fiber, not even using defensively, a horse who's two to one, you can get some value in your tickets. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to think uh, how many people played a multi race bet and tossed Wonder Godot? I mean, most people aren't doing that. You know, I mean, I, you know, no offense, but the guys at the track, uh, at the first floor of your racetrack, are, are using both in multi race bets. Uh, there's a lot of people that are using both, and if you can just use one, I feel like you have a real big edge in equity there. So uh, whether the horse is four to five or not, there was a fifty cent pick three eight eight seven that came back for each fifty cents wagered one thirty seven eighty five. Not too bad. Hopefully, some of the listeners out there had it. J.K. I can only assume construction has started on the new wing of your house to fit all the money you won over the weekend. Well, about that. Um, so, so, so those of of us who who have kids, and you being one of them, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners do, it's a tough balance sometimes handling the horse play with the child because the uh, the big racing happens typically when the child doesn't have school, right? So there's a lot of days in which I find myself having to do both. Um, However, we, we, we had a great day at Santa Anita with, with, uh, with the Pear Bear, and, and, and my son Austin was there as well, and, and your wife and other friends and stuff like that. And so Friday was kind of our track day, and Saturday I decided just to completely disconnect. And so uh, I barely turned on the phone in time to watch the race, uh, but I did not have a penny on the horse. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, but but, it, 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 but it, it, at the same time, I did not wager at all for the day. So it wasn't like I gave that horse out, bet other horses, didn't bet that one. I did not bet a horse on Saturday. I was trying to be a, um, uh, a, a fully attentive father for the day. So I, 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 I wasn't involved. It can be hard to strike that balance. And there's many ways of... Uh, of looking at it, right? I mean, I think a lot of horse players, when they're in that situation where um, family uh, is coming, family or a work commitment or something is coming first, they think about it in terms of the missed opportunity. But there are there is another way to think about it. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I, I was actually talking to a friend yesterday who's, who's had a bad run, um, and. You know, the lesson that I learned a long time ago is that, you know, sometimes you just got to take a break. And I think as horse players, uh, because we put in so much time and effort into, you know, trip notes and, and watching races. And, 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 and when you when you have a when you, when you know you like a horse or a situation or a stake or whatever, you feel like you have to participate. And and one of the things that I've I've learned and I still try to tell myself and remind myself is that you don't have to play. Yes, you're potentially going to miss an opportunity to score but more often than not you're actually missing opportunities to lose so it it cancels each other out in the long run so you know i I recommend that most people just uh take a deep breath and 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 take a break when things aren't going the right direction and so and it wasn't my saturday break wasn't about a direction that my play is going um uh it it was just more about you know uh, i'm okay with missing a day or two here or there one compromise that I think a lot of players come up with, uh, and I hope I don't upset that one uh, friend on Twitter, but uh, the idea of the 
the, the all-in contest, pick and pray in some circles. If you want to stay in touch somehow, you could go ahead and put in a set of picks. But uh, with our, our friends at, at CDI, you know, not always playing well with others, wouldn't have helped you on Saturday anyway, JK. No, absolutely. You're right about that. No, that's, that's definitely true. It, it wouldn't have... Uh... Wouldn't have done any favors, so and, and maybe I would have been involved in in a, in, a, in a tournament where I can just kind of all in it real quick. But uh, like you said, uh, fairgrounds was not uh, available. When they get their report card, we'll, we'll make sure to put that under you know where it says at the bottom they get the grades for for different things, and, and then the, they write in that that place for comments. Doesn't play well with others. That might work. Yeah, they're also gonna get a, they're also gonna get a, a D or an F for for a technology presentation. They're like the only. The only person you still can't find their feed in HD online, which, which is, uh, which is a little bit aggravating, especially because, not to get down the technology rabbit hole, they were the first ones that I was aware of that used to broadcast their feeds in HD. Fairgrounds, Arlington, and Churchill were in HD on Twin Spires, and and now they're not. And now they're not in HD anywhere, whether you're on Roberts or, you know, or Express Bet or DRF Bets or whatever. Like they don't they don't have their feed in HD. It's that awful, awful, awful standard definition that you really have no idea what's going on. You speak that as uh, uh, not just a racing fan, but also as a trip handicapper. I imagine it makes life a lot more difficult when you're not being able to see in HD. Oh, absolutely. Like, man, like. Like the Naira, what Naira has, I think Naira has probably the best media presentation. If you've never been to Naira's, uh, like replay website, they have a H, they have a HD feed, um, that you can replays that you can watch for free, and they also have HD head-ons that you can watch for free. And uh, the HD head-on, in my opinion, is the most underrated thing in handicapping. You can see things in an HD head-on that you will not see in any other situation. It can be very informative in, in terms of trips. All right, uh, let's move on from this sort of back padding discussion that we started the show with to talk about, uh, actually, there's a question that piggybacks nicely off this, and I want to go to that first. And the question is, these three-year-old races this time of year, because you're dealing with these improving horses, the form, you often get favorites where they're not... uh, they're not, they're not always going to run to form, the favorites. How do you, what are some more tips you can give us, J.K., to identify the improving three-year-olds who are the good bets in these prep races? Well, I think, that, you know, one of the things you can look at is well-bred uh, horses that I, I think can, can give you tips that that horse could improve. I also think that horses that are bet at short distances and do not run well who are now trying longer distances, right? So you see a horse that debuts uh, at Saratoga, at Churchill, or at Gulfstream, and the horse is, uh, is, you know, debuts two to one and runs fifth, and even fifth going six. Now the horse is running a mile and a 16th or a mile and an eighth. In some instances, uh, I think there's a, there's a, in a well-bred, well-trained uh, type of situation. I think you can look for an improvement there. Um, and that's kind of, you know, Bravazo is a Calumet horse, so he's obviously has some type of breeding. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and so situations that I think are other clues that you can look for when you're looking for an improving three-year-old. Another thing is I, I kind of like those even running lines. When you look at the running line and it's like four, 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 like it's just like they were just in fourth all the way around there in a seven furlong race. Now that they're kind of uh, uh, stepping up in distance, you'd expect that that uh, even run could turn into more of a of a of a of a kind of a killer run that could get get them in the uh, winner circle. That's interesting. So distance very specifically is the thing you're looking for. It makes sense. I mean, throughout a lot of the year, I think a lot of players don't really look at that fundamental factor. But you uh, you think it, you have to pay attention in these early three year old races? Do, is it something you continue to look at uh, as horses develop throughout the three year old year and, and on to four and beyond? Yeah, no, I think I mean I, I love one of my favorite handicapping angles is kind of like the two to three. You know, I I, I love the, the two year old to three year old time where 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 you can find some horses who you know the Monomoy girl thing was like she ran such a good figure as a two year old. Um, and I was so impressed with, with how she ran as a two-year-old that I, I figured that, that the natural progression 
that that mm. that one sees from two to three would see her uh, it'd be tough in that spot against Wonder Godot. And, and that was, you know, so I, I love those those situations. I, I like it when horses are changing and you can kind of find some hidden improvement that's not always going to be uh, jumping off the page in the PPs like certain things do that, that make horses four to five. But, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, uh, I do like those types of races. We had a great time out there at Santa Anita on Friday. Always a good time at the great race place. Got to see a lot of friends. You, I noticed, your new best friend, Bob Baffert, uh, spoke to him multiple times throughout the day. What were you guys talking about? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's funny. I, 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 uh, I saw him coming up the escalator, and I'll be completely honest. I said to myself, we did talk about three times, like, over the Pegasus weekend at, at, the, at Joe's, at the dinner situation where I saw him and the kid I used to coach. And then after the Pegasus, uh, in the in the little room we were in, the Post Malone con- concert situation, and I talked to him both times. But I, you know, and I've met him before, but I just I didn't think he was gonna, you know, say anything to me. And he came up the stairs and he like said hello, and he talked to my son, and and we chatted, and, and he said uh, he said what happened to you last weekend? I, I I saw you were doing good, and then uh, I didn't see your name anymore, which was funny that he like looked at the NHC leaderboard for my name. I thought was was cool, and I was like, well, you know, I I have, will you autograph my silver wig? Um, and then, and then, uh, and then when we were down by the paddock, when I was on my way out, uh, we, we talked again and he talked to Austin and asked uh, Austin if he wanted to be a jockey. And Austin was like, no, <laughs> and so, uh, we, uh, and then we just talked about, we talked about the, the kid that we have in, in common, the, the, uh, the kid, uh, Jake Brindle that, that, uh, is dating his niece and that, that I coached, uh, when I was at Plano East, um, who's in the NFL now. And we just talked about him. So it, it, it was pretty cool. I, you know, especially for a, as a as a uh, a card carrying member of the Bob Baffert fan club, it's uh, it's it's nice to 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 have conversations with him when I see him. I assumed he was asking you when he said what happened when he was talking about your double goose egg in the Pegasus contest, not your uh, semifinal finish back in Vegas. But uh, what do I know? Um, I'm also surprised you didn't take the opportunity, or maybe you did, to ask him about this new trainee of his who's been turning heads. Why don't you talk about that runner for a little bit? Well, this was on Friday. I should have asked him if he had any winners, but obviously the tote board knew the horse went off at what one to two or two to five. But uh, uh, pretty impressive uh, what Justify did um, over the weekend. I believe it was on Sunday or Monday. But uh, our friend Craig Milkowski, who who uh, I think most of our listeners know the respect we have for him and, and his work and his figures, uh, gave the horse I think a one thirty one time form US, Jeez. which is the second fastest. Uh, 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 figure he's given um, for a maiden breaker, the fastest being uh, a, a horse whose buyer figure turned him into a stallion, and that's McLean's music. So uh, I believe he got a 136 time for him figure uh, for his maiden win back in, I guess it was maybe 2000, and, uh, I think that's like 2005, 6, 7, 8, something like that. So uh, <laughs> one of those years, it's all a blur yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's, it's one of those. I, I, I don't see the tweet in front of me, but that, but, uh, Pretty impressive, uh, you know. Looked good on the tape. Uh, good for Drayden Van Dyke. I know Drayden's been, been, uh, you know, working a lot for Bob, and and uh, good for him to get on a good horse like this. And uh, who else would you want to have a horse that you're trying to uh, kind of catch up with, play catch up with on the Derby Trail, uh, than Bob Baffert? He obviously knows how to get that uh, get that race won. Well, and uh, he's shown in the last two years with the last two three year old champions that it's not all about rushing. For the Derby, if the horse is saying he's not ready, I think this could be another horse who looks for late year targets like the the Travers, etc. Um, so, so yeah, you got to feel like Justify is in the right hands. Ends up with a 104 buyer speed figure. Nice article on DRF.com right now by Steve Anderson about it. If folks want to read a little bit more, um, owned by Windstar. China Horse Club and SF Racing purchased for 500000 at Keeneland September 2016. And I can already hear it, JK. I can already hear the people saying, nope, no shot. Uh, didn't race it to Curse of Apollo. What do you say to them? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not really a big uh, Curse of Apollo guy. I just think it's more circumstantial. But uh, look, the horse ran really fast through every stage of the race. It wasn't just a fast final time. 
he was fast throughout. He went like 21 and four and 44 and two. I mean, the, the horse was absolutely getting it. Um, and it wasn't like asked for everything home either. It, it, I thought the horse was super impressive. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, he's obviously bred a uh, Windstar is not really in the business of, of, of buying horses that can't become stallion. They're not looking for sprinters. So you would expect that this horse, obviously being my scat daddy, wouldn't have a problem stretching out his distance. And, and like I said, we'll, I'm sure we'll see him. I would imagine that, that Moreno's or Mourinho's run yesterday in the Southwest, which I know we'll get to, uh, could potentially find him going in a different direction. And I could see them taking the uh, kind of Bodie Meister route with Justify and sending him uh, down to, to Oak Lawn. I know Baffert obviously does well there. He likes that prep. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see where, where he shows up next. Amazing from the last crop of the amazing Gone Too Soon Scat Daddy. Um, that's one of the notes that pops to mind. I'm going to ask you a question that you can look up while I uh, talk a little bit more about this horse. And I'm just curious how Craig Milkowski at time form coded the pace figures, if they were coded red. I would think they would be, but maybe the final time is so fast they're not. The reason I say that is when you just look at the raw numbers, 2180 for the opening quarter, 4437 for the half. Um, both uh, Baffert said he didn't like him going that fast early. To your point, J.K., that sometimes the ones who are going to be more likely to stretch out are the ones running more evenly. But this might just be a case of a horse, not that he was running inefficiently so much as he was just – that darn fast what did craig have to say yeah he didn't he didn't have it coded it, it's uh it's not coded so it's it's uh no blue no red so I, it was efficient I, for i think what that means is it was efficient for that final time be very interesting to follow where this horse goes and uh let's talk about a couple more races first but I, this is one justifies one we're going to return to a little bit later in the show when we do a little bit of buy sell hold but uh, meanwhile, why don't you talk about the Southwest, J.K., uh, a race I, unfortunately, traveling, running around, haven't had a chance to see yet, but I know there's a lot of chatter about it. Yeah, I set my alarm to, to uh, a horse player's best friend is your iPhone timer. You can even have Siri help you out, where if you're looking at a race and it says minutes to post 19, you say, Siri, uh, set my remi- or, or Siri, set my timer for 18 minutes and, you know, whatever, it's easy and it, the alarm goes off, you log in, you watch the race. Um, if you're at Gulfstream and you say, it says 19 minutes to post, you say, Siri, set my alarm for 27 minutes. And then usually you still have to wait a little bit. Um, <laughs> is that literal? That, yeah. Would you, would you, re- what would you, that's actually a good question. What would you actually do for a Gulfstream race? You wouldn't go eight minutes past, would you? No, no. If it was 19, I would probably, if it was 19 minutes to post, I would probably say 24. Gotcha. Give it five. But in truth, you, there would be time. You're still waiting another five. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I wanted to yeah. clarify. No, no, no. It's fine. So anyway, so I, I missed the race live yesterday, the Southwest, but I actually turned it on and watched the, the replay. Um, and and while I was waiting for the replay to come back on, I noticed that the pick five will pays were up. And the first four winners were one horse, one horse, the three horse, the one horse. And I said to myself, well, I haven't watched a race all day. Sounds like a good inside to me. Sure watch does. the race. Kent DeSormo, uh, Great ride, uh, even better post-race interview. Um, but he, he sat the inside trip the entire way and, and and was loaded when they turned for home. The seam opened, and he fired through, throwing those Kent DeSormo crosses at the horse that really get them to run. And uh, I thought the horse was impressive considering, but he's not. He's definitely one that I would look forward to betting against considering the, the, the surface and what appears to be a, a good inside. Horse is called My Boy Jack by Creative Cause, earned a 93 buyer speed figure. Mike Maloney talks in the book, Betting with an Edge, about how there are days when a bias is so strong, uh, R3 type bias, where you might end up betting on numbers or at least throwing in numbers as much as you're handicapping so strong is the bias. Just from that pick five result, it sounds that way. Obviously, not having watched a race, I'm going to slow my roll a little bit before declaring it. But definitely something to go back and look at when you're looking at the charts and especially the tape of Monday from Oaklawn. Biases like that can really flatter some horses and really offer excuses for some others. Is there anyone specifically, JK, coming out of the Southwest who you would be willing to give another chance 
for perhaps being on the wrong side of a potential track situation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's two horses behind my boy Jack that, that uh, I would cut in line to bet next time. And that's combatant for Steve Asmus. And that horse uh, was five wide and, and, uh, and, and was running late. Uh, the inside was good and he was five wide. I'll let you figure out what that means. Um, and then sporting chance I thought was, was good. He, he, he came back from his race at Saratoga and, well enough, you know, for D Wayne and, and obviously Lucas has got a few horses going in the right direction. I think that that horse is one that you would maybe consider um, moving forward. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in combatant. Um, you know, he matched his time form U.S. figure essentially from his previous race, uh, and 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 obviously was on the wrong part of the track uh, with it being so good on the inside. Mourinho was bet to six to five favoritism in the Southwest. Uh, looks like he went to the lead. Was he was he on the rail or was he in the two? What what was the situation? Do you see an excuse for him at all, or is he one approach with caution next time out? Yeah, the time from U.S. trip note says old rail. I, I you know I guess the, the head on showed him on the backside a lot of the a lot of the time and on the turn on the rail as well. No, not much of an excuse there for him. I guess maybe he didn't like the surface, or maybe the the distance is starting to catch up to him a bit. Uh, maybe he wants to uh, go a little shorter. Uh, he's the type of horse that uh, if we were buy, hold, selling, uh, I'd like to get down for the Allen H. Jerkins. We just got a pretty funny picture sent to us via Twitter. I don't know if you're looking at your Twitter. It's the it, I don't know what they call it. It's like the bad boyfriend meme or whatever. Are you looking at this, J.K.? <laughs> and the bad boyfriend, while while standing uh, next to presumed girlfriend McKinsey, uh, check out over his shoulder. Justify. You think there's think there's some truth in the picture? What do you? No, I, I think Afford loves having a lot of bullets to fire, and um, I think he's uh, he'll. I imagine he'll keep McKinsey in California. Uh, it's kind of what he did, you know, with the Dortmund American Pharaoh thing. You know the. McKinsey has been doing his running in graded stakes in California, so he'll stay there. Um, and then Justify will probably get on the plane. And, and Windstar, I think, would appreciate to see a, a horse like Justify run it in Lexington. Um, uh, and, and maybe the Bluegrass or something like that. So um, if not Oaklawn. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think Baffert probably like both. Um, I don't think he's giving up on McKinsey by any means, but it is definitely a funny, a funny image. Thanks to that real chess champ for that one. I had no idea Gary Kasparov listened to the podcast. That's pretty cool. Um, all right, where do we want to go from here? Any other racing from the weekend? Any results that stood out to you, J.K.? Uh, we had this. Uh, we had the stakes on Monday. I managed to give out Martini Glass and a piece on DR in the Royal Delta, and then missed the second half of the double. Typical, typical bad luck. I remain with a with a perfect record. Knows how I'm playing things. Perfect. And I'm not sure if I ever complete an exotic wager in them. Uh, but was there anything else you saw along the way worthy of discussion? Um, yeah, I noticed in my ad, like, I, I picked, uh, I, I had five combinations, six combinations and out of the gate and like four and a half of them scratched. Well, uh, is that crazy thing with the the virus, the equine outbreak and, and uh, the horses not being able to compete that caused the the destruction of those uh, those stakes right down at Laurel. Did that have to do with it? I would imagine so. Yeah, the, the, most of the horses that I was on were horses down from New York. So, I imagine that had a large large part to do. Check out drf.com for the latest on the story. Hopefully, uh, it's something that's under control in the in short order. Does that do oh, racing? Yeah, yeah. No, Peter, I, I may be already going to get there, and so forgive me for for being in front of you, but. Uh, I thought the piece that you wrote uh, from the NH was outstanding. It, it, uh, I forwarded it on to a couple of friends who don't always look at Twitter as much and said, grab a Kleenex. And then I and so uh, canceled my retweet, quote retweeted it again, grab your Kleenex. Uh, it's, it, it'll pull at your, uh, that thing in your throat that, that makes you kind of lump up when, when, you, when you're about to cry. So it, was really it gets good. dusty. It gets a little dusty when you're about the story of John Rowe. And thanks to Steve Bick, John, on for an extended segment this week. Steve's done such a good job coming out of Vegas with guests like Scott Carr. So those of you who like the tournament content, go check out Steve Bick.com archive. 
and look for some of the players um, coming out of Vegas who who had high up finish. But no story coming out of that whole event is better than John Rowe. I don't want to. I won't give away the story. I'll let people check it out. But, th- but this is a guy who's had uh, trials and tribulations over the course of the last year. He, he could say Job was a wimp. All right, like this is a guy dealing with some stuff has really used. Um, his horse playing and horse racing as part of the healing process. And I definitely encourage folks to check it out. And he seems like a guy to root for, uh, for sure, as we go forward. Still has some hills to climb in terms of his health, but uh, definitely definitely somebody who's very easy to support and one of the many players I had the pleasure of meeting at the NHC. It was interesting, you know, at that, uh, in that contest, four of the ten players at the final table were rookies is that just randomness jonathan or, or does that relate i think it's a great format i don't want to knock the format but is there something about the format that lends itself to maybe a little bit of seeming randomness or are there is there just a lot of good new talented blood coming into the game um no there's a lot of probably talented new blood coming into the game um you know i mean like i, I love the nhc and, and it's always a, a, an event that i'll try to qualify for every year just for the for the uh, for the accomplishment, but also because of the you know the fun of hanging out in Vegas, all the fun stories and, and getting to hang out with horse players. But it, to me, it's 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 it's, it's a, in order to win that contest, you, you you have to be you have to be pretty darn good, but you got to be really darn lucky, and um, you got to have a lot of things kind of go your way. So um, you know, I, I think that that a lot of guys probably have ideas of six they have success in the past in the contest and they think that that's probably the the method that they need to 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 always do to get there and some of the new guys just coming in or just they're just wheeling and dealing and picking horses i maybe the 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 stress level or the the mental exhaustion you know you just kind of trick yourself into into doing well i mean my first nhc was my best nhc maybe there is something to it it is interesting I, i i never thought of it that way but uh, rookies had great success. The John Rose story, check it out. Um, and maybe with John's permission, I'll post some some pictures of him and his family that help illustrate the tale. He, he's this is a guy who we might have on the show not to to talk more about this story so much as to get some of his stories about growing up walking distance in Cicero from Hawthorne and Sportsman's Park. His dad was a bar owner, a racing bar. I see. I saw the, the mural on the wall, and this was in the days. I, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but I believe back then the bars were open 24/7. So near a racetrack, bar open 24/7. I'm going to take a wild guess that he has some stories to tell. What do you think about the idea of getting him in here for a segment sometime soon? Man, uh, if, if you've ever been to Hawthorne and you know that he grew up that close to Hawthorne, you got to know stories are uh, are beyond entertaining it's a uh, it's uh, a don't get me wrong i love hawthorne but it is in the middle of uh of 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 a working class community uh you know smokestacks and all of that good stuff where it, you know you know that the people that that uh that grew up in, in cicero could probably throw a few blows and a fist fight and and mm. uh know what it's like to get up and take your lunch pail to work well, 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 let's let's make that happen. Note to self, uh, we'll book him. Uh, we'll record something and and uh, and use it in one of the upcoming shows. There was some news on drf.com right now about an old friend, J.K. You know what I'm talking about? No, I, I don't know. I'm looking now. You got me all. I, I just I, I typed as fast as I possibly could. Divisadero getting ready for new season under new trainer, says Marty McGee, pages of DRF. Uh, apparently, Divisadero getting uh, transferred to Fair Hill with Kelly Rubley, uh, who's become the primary trainer for Gunpowder Farms. Uh, so you know what? We're not done talking about Divisadero on this show. When you okay, so a couple of things. When you said transfer to Fair Hill, I I kind of got really excited and thought he was going to Grand Motion. <laughs> um, but but that, no, that's fine. Kelly Rubley, yeah, no no issues there. No, I you know. We we talked about it recently. Gunpowder they they buy a nice horse. I, I don't know who does their who does their uh, bloodstock work, but they um, they do uh, they do buy a nice horse. 
Kelly Rubley now crossed Jonathan Kinchin off the holiday card list. Um, <laughs> Fairhill's an amazing place. I mean, I, having spent just a little bit of time there, and I've said this before on the show, but I will give horses, especially horses, you know, a place like Saratoga, in, in on routes of ground especially, I feel like horses can get extra fitness there in that environment with the different ways they can train with the hills and the wood chips and the different training courses and the equine spa and this and that all these things yes some of those they have equivalents on the racetrack but i do believe some horses in particular respond really well to those more bucolic surroundings than a typical uh, usa backstretch it, it's the kind of place where if i notice a horse who's um, going back there, who's been on the road, or I'll notice that when I look at uh, when I look at PPs and I'll factor it in, not as a primary handicapping factor, but as a secondary one. Do you think I'm, I'm overrating it or do you think there's anything to that idea? No, I think there's something to it. I think that, uh, you know, we always hear trainers say things that and we just kind of let them go in one ear and out the other. But one of the things they always say is, oh, I just got to keep the horse happy. And I don't understand. And I believe that there's probably some truth to that. And I don't understand how horses can be any happier than a place like Fairhill. Makes absolute sense to me. Um, before speaking we... of, of of Fairhill's surface, right? I, I did. Yeah. It reminded me when we were thinking about the because they have tapita there, right? They do have. A, I think they have a tapita track. They have a dirt track. They have a wood chip track, and then they've got like hills where they can go hack around. Well, it reminded me of of of, uh, of uh, a Philly. We should probably talk about Paved, who won the El Camino uh, Derby at, at Golden Gate. The only the only uh, Philly that was in the race, and and Mike McCarthy uh, thought enough to send her up there. She went off at two to one and, and won that uh, stake against the boys. So, I think that she's probably one that we'll see on the turf uh, in some three year old races moving forward. And, and heck, she might even try to find a way to start getting onto the. Uh, on the Kentucky Oaks trail, but uh, I thought that that was definitely needed to be addressed. We don't probably talk about golden gate very often here, but, uh, but Mike McCarthy is having a good year with, uh, with the, uh, uh, of course, you, this is that thing you told me not to do the big horse that won the Malibu. Um, ugh. anyways, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's a reason I told you not to do it. Uh, what's the breeding <laughs> on this horse that you're suggesting maybe for the, for the dirt? Yeah. Quality road, um, out of a cozine mare. Um, a lot of turf though, but a lot of turf, but, but the fact that the horses won on Polly and, um, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that they'll, they'll try the dirt at some point, but obviously there was something about the horse that, that felt like the Polly and the turf, uh, suits her. So city of light, I believe is the horse you were trying to come city up of with. Light. Did I city bail you out light. this time? PTF with the save <laughs> Johnny on the spot. Um, uh, before we leave, the dis- sort of weaving in and out of a little bit of tournament talk. Just want to remind folks again, uh, no official announcements yet, but very cool sounding event, very horse player friendly coming up Preakness weekend at Santa Anita. Uh, so we've just been, ish- DRF is going to be involved, issuing some save the date remarks about it. What do you, uh, what can you tell folks about this contest, Jonathan? Yeah, I think the basic idea um, to keep in mind is, is, is we're looking at a $5,000 live bankroll contest um, with no entry fee. Um, similar to the Pegasus, but obviously the $5,000 price point is much easier to approach than the $12,000. Uh, the two-day situation, um, money added to the pool, and uh, some fun other uh, things that are going to go along with it. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing maybe some uh, some production, uh, television situation that's going to accompany it so uh excited to uh, be able to blast out that news when it's appropriate but saving the date is is definitely uh something we wanted people to be able to do players are definitely making their plans for the year whether it's trips uh for, for pure recreation or for contests i will say that um santa Anita is a really fun place to watch the preakness that's been a stop on our dance card whatever it's been now the last three or four years and it's uh it's it's it it works you don't have to deal with the the chaos of uh of baltimore i mean of course that's fun too if you're into it wouldn't discourage anyone from going live but if you're looking for something racing related with a bit more sanity um and it sounds like this will be the only contest game in town in the west this year last year there was an event i believe preakness weekend also at treasure island but i think this year santa anita 
is going to be the only game in town. So something else to something else for folks to consider when making their travel plans for 2018. All right. Are we ready to look at some Derby prices, Jonathan? Let us do it. Excellent. Of course, the, the computer I'm talking to from the phone this time, my computer freezing in this little phone booth led to the greatest podcast opening of all time by, by what I'm hearing from fans last week. But now it's uh, it's slowing me down to get to where to where I need to be here. Oh, <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of producer Craig, um, who's out of the office working from home today. But I wanted to give him a shout out because did you realize, Jonathan, that this week is the one year anniversary of Out of the Gate? the RF's spectacular weekend preview show. Oh, so it's the one year an- year anniversary of the last time I gave an out of the gate winner. <laughs> no, I, that's, I not, been, that's not that's not literally that, true, right? is it? The, no, no, I no, I gave a winner if you if you <laughs> although my first the two legs of my double this weekend at Laurel scratched the, and then I did have the winner in the second leg, so uh, that's got to count as something. At least my a favorite my favorite thing, and just to show how snake bit you are with this, you know, we we referred to the, the, the not play well with others thing before. Um, I specifically saw the note where producer Craig told you, uh, JK, when you do your out of the gate this week, no, no fairgrounds. So you were robbed the opportunity to give out that hundred and sixty five dollar for 50 cent pick three that mm-hmm. I'm sure you would have. So. That just goes to show it's not it's not just it's it's not a it's not a question of your competence so much as a lot of bad luck when it comes to your out of the gate performance. Probably I'd like to claim similar for my performance in the How I'm Playing series. What do you think? I think it's fair. I think it's fair. We, we, we try to try to help on this show as much as possible. So we hopefully we made up for it. We get them from time to time. You did make that joke on Twitter I saw about, you know, don't expect it to happen for six to eight months. Explain that a little bit more. <laughs> oh, no. It was, that was just a sideways way of, like, of, uh, of, of taking away the, the braggadocious uh, vibe of that tweet by making fun of us a little bit. It, yes. But I didn't mean it. Well, we'll pick another winner next week. How about that? Yeah, I like it. It's always tricky to walk that line. I mean, definitely in my experience, the most successful players, the tendency is – to downplay the wins and play up the losses. But at the same time, when you're hosting a podcast and you're in the employ of an entity like DRF, we can't be completely self-effacing. And you know what? Like, I get it. To me, the red boarding that's annoying is the, is the, is the real aftertiming, the stuff where you had an opportunity to say what you like before the race. You're sitting with people at a table. Everybody's talking about the race. And, you know, some horse never comes up and then the race runs and some jerks like, oh, yeah, I had it. I, I used it in the pick three, whatever it is. And it's some 21 to one shot. And it's like, well, you know what? Either say it before or don't say it. That's where that stuff gets obnoxious <laughs> to me. If you call your shot and you're out there and you make a cogent case like you did, JK, showing your work and everything for why the horse is going to win and then the horse wins. I'm not a ticket flash guy. I don't like that move so much. I don't know why it just rubs me the wrong way, but I have no problem at all just saying, hey, you know, shout out to the podcast listeners who were smart enough to, to throw this horse on a ticket. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And this story reminds me, it's, it's probably a podcast after dark uh, story. Oh, when, uh-oh, when, here we when, go. When we, what, what the piper said to you after, uh, oh. after you, you told him you Yeah. <laughs> Well, but the, the ridiculous thing about that, he bets the race. He likes Sadler's Joy. And, you know, this is a horse who I'm not a, at all a go up to people and tell them, make sure you have so-and-so on your ticket. But that horse at that price, you know, I went up to our buddy Doogie and he said he was playing the double. And I said, just make sure you have this crazy horse on. Like I was, I was talking about that horse to put on. And, and you know, obviously we did whatever, 17 hours of broadcasting the week before and talked about the horse, you know, 26 times. So then he's looking at me as if I'm the jerk who said, hey, I have the 20 to one shot that, that, that hadn't talked about it before the race. He's cursing me this and that. And I, I think I just told him, hey, you know, hey, look, man, you, this is why you got to listen to the DRF Players podcast. And I think that just made him twice as mad. <laughs> I actually Fine. talked to him this morning. This is a side, side note. But I talked to him this morning and I said, uh, I, the first thing I said to him was like, hey, that's Jerry Bailey. Because that's how he, you know, he always says that when he tells the Jerry Bailey story. It's a famous Jerry Bailey story, which will be featured on the next 
players podcast after dark, which could, who knows if we have any energy left, could be that treat this weekend. But of course we love him. He's the Sultan of Schenectady, the Piper at the gates of dawn, jockey agent to the stars, Chris Pippino. Uh, and we'll, we'll get him back for an appearance soon. He did a fantastic job. He was on with us before the Travers, right? Uh, I, no, I think it was a personal ensign. Um, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Excuse it's me. the Our, same. Isn't yeah, it? the personal ensign. Yeah, the personal. Oh, is it the same? Uh, yeah, I think you're getting mixed up. I think, I think, I think he yeah, was on that. For, yeah, because it was the day we had very good luck after having Chris on the show. So, therefore, the next time we really need a winner, maybe we'll bring him back. He's always entertaining, even when you have to censor him. Um, but uncensored, it, that, that'll be something, that, that magical day when that finally happens. Um, all right, let's look at some derby prices right now. I'm looking at the short part of the market. First, there are three horses listed on Odds Checker as under 20 to 1. They are Bolt Doro at 10, Good Magic at 12, and Audible at 12. Your thoughts? Uh, Bolt Doro... Uh, sell I mean, without a doubt. Uh, yes, exactly. Like I, the PTF sports book is accepting wagers at ten to one at this point. Yeah, I mean, is he even working? Uh, that's what I'm saying. I don't. I don't. I think that that could be. Sometimes you get on here some like phantom prices of books who aren't really like super duper paying attention because we're looking at you know American stuff on an English uh, on an English site. But yeah, I mean that it would seem. He would seem to be ten to one to make the race at this point, wouldn't he? I, I, I think I'm not positive. Don't take this to the bank, but I believe on February eighth he worked in blinkers. So like clearly, like there's like what does that tell trying, you? Well, they're trying to like wake him up, or they're trying to get something's not the work before that they must not have liked, or they're going to add blink. I mean, it's just weird. You're going to add blinkers to a horse that ran a, a, a triple digit buyer as a two year old. I, I, I Okay, I, I guess. I, yeah, sell, without a doubt. Good magic. Uh, let's see what he does when he comes back. I think at this point I'd sell. Feels like 10 to 1. Uh, you, you could probably get 10 to 1 on the day. Uh, so why take it now? Um, Absolutely. And then and then Audible, you know, I feel like it's a little bit too late. You wanted Audible. You, the wise guy move was Audible at 40 to 1 uh, at a sports book in Vegas or, or, or 50 to 1 or 60 to 1 or 70 to 1. But uh, I'll, I'll pass it ten to one. All right, looking down some other prices, McKinsey ranging between fourteen to one and twenty to one at some of the books right now. You know, I've been skeptical. Um, you talked about in a previous conversation with uh, your your friend with the white hair that that he was excited about the horse, and that seemed to be turning you around. I'm going to stick with my skepticism. I wouldn't be in a hurry to sell at 20 to one, but I also wouldn't be in a hurry to buy. Yeah. I think I would just hold, huh? I mean, uh, look at that. I'm learning. You're, there you go. That's right. We, we don't have to explain this concept to you anymore. <laughs> Haha. Our friend justify has appeared only at one book, 28 to one. What do you think about that? No, he's not, he hasn't even gone two turns yet. I mean, who, who, who would book him at 28? Who would take him at 28 to one? You know what you should have done? is and, and, and it was the move that happened you know last year with with mastery that, that the prince of keelan and i did was we bet mastery 45 minutes before his maiden race then he won and we got 150 to one like if, that, that's if you're gonna bet that horse you were supposed to bet him before he ran um and then you would have been the wise guy smart guy but i don't see just for uh, fun just see. for fun i'll argue it this way what if reports are positive coming out of the race what if the next move is a two-turn graded stake that you think he's going to win. What price would he be coming out of that? Like, is it to apply the same logic that you're talking about, but instead of getting a horse that should be 25 or 30 at 150, you're getting a horse at 28 who's about to be 10. Is, is, that, is there anything to that, or do you just feel it's like it's reaching for the stars too much? Yeah, I mean, okay, so so... What, what, what is it? It's February. So say he comes back and he runs, um, what, what, uh, he runs in, you know, the next prep at, uh, at Oakland, he runs in the rebel at Oakland and he wins that race by three and he runs another triple digit buyer. I mean, he's, he's still going to be behind, you know, he'll still probably be even with behind audible or McKinsey yeah. and, and, and good magic comes back and wins and, 
I just yeah. I, no, you're making a good point. Short. I and also when, wonder when so if, many things can now. Now yeah. is the twenty-eight to one? Is the run? Is it twenty-eight to one runner? Uh, no runner, no bet. Uh, I do, that is a great question. I'm going to assume this is an. I'm just going to assume this bet is action. Okay. Yeah. Then absolutely not. I mean, so many things can go wrong. Yeah. No, you make you make you make a good case. You make a good case. Well, at what price would you get interested? I mean, you de trip if it was a hundred to one now. I mean, I I would say that would be a no brainer yep. to take a flyer. Yeah, it'd have to be oh. seventy five or above. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, the future betting future fixed odds future betting is really uh, it's a fun way of looking at the world. A couple more that we'll hit here. Because um, here, here's the thing, Pete. I almost think you can get seventy five to one on the day. If you take, if you bet an exacta, would justify with all? I don't think so. You don't think so? No. T- the effect of takeout and having to use nineteen other runners all of a sudden, you're you're gonna be. What if you use ten? Yeah, if you can eliminate half the field, you can start to get there. But but when you're talking about all, you know, it's it's that math that that math is no bueno. Okay, well, I'm not an all guy anyway, so I'll just do yeah. half. <laughs> <laughs> but I see what you're saying. If you use your opinion with him as a key, you could get you could get there. You know, assuming yeah. your opinion is is able to to eliminate you know a little bit more than half the field, then that starts to sound a lot more reasonable. The other thing with justify that's going to be interesting for futures and maybe even on the day if things go well is there's going to be this Apollo money, let's call it, that I'm extremely happy to fade because I don't think it means I mean I don't want to say it means nothing because these sort of big picture trends are um, they're not irrelevant but they're like not only are they priced into the market they're overpriced into the market to me because of the way they fit this like fancy little narrative and I'm a lot more interested in how a horse fits in this race against this group of horses based on his pace figures and his final figures than I am in anything having to do with historical trends. And I, and I mean, the, the, the problem here is I think you're going to agree with me. It would be fun to have somebody who's more of a trends player argue, you know, why this horse could never win. I, I don't think either of us feel that way at all. No, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why a horse that has never won the Derby the, the, you know, the Apollo, of course, that didn't run it too. And I don't, I just think it's more circumstantial. I, I don't think they tried it very much back in the day. I think that a horse that's good enough and talented enough and didn't have issues enough probably ran as a two year old. So then there's so many things that don't necessarily indicate that, that, uh, that, 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 you know, that that's the reason why. I mean, what Verrazano, obviously, he wasn't going to, he didn't run well in the Derby, but like, he, what he broke his maiden on the thirty first, like so he's clear now. Like eh, right. just, Dan uh, Elman did some great work a few years ago looking at the run the actual runners. And whenever you have a macro stat like that, it's smart to drill down and look a little bit at the specific runners. And I will say I was amazed at looking at the actual horses, you would have thought by randomness that at least one of them would have won. And it did make you wonder, it made me take it a little bit more seriously, looking at that list at some of the talented horses who just weren't able to have their act ready by the first Saturday in May for this particular test. It did give me, give it a little bit of credence. But again, whatever credence it made me give it is not to the degree that I expect the market to react when it comes to this horse. So that just wants to you know, put, puts me back in this. Let's hope this horse continues to develop, JK, and let's hope this is the first of many conversations about the Curse of Apollo that we have, we happen to have on the show. Let's get to a few other horses. Your boy, Bravazo, 33 to 1. A lot of horses at 33. Um, what do you, I mean, that, that seems a little nuts to me in terms of it's too short. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, the wins odds from, I guess, earlier in the month. They might be old, but at one point he was 150 to one. So like I, I just I, I can't makes my teeth itch. Like, there's no way I would take a horse like that at 33 to one. Catholic boy, there's some 33 to one about him. I mean that's a horse who I can totally forgive the last race. I, I think he had to be short. Um, yes, it would have been nice the trip he got to see him go by in the stretch. But if you're gonna of the numbers we've talked about so far, um, and you want to give me a few bucks to put a flyer out. Some of these horses in the 33 to 1 range, you got him, 
You've got Free Drop Billy. Um, oh, here's a horse we should talk about for a minute anyway. Instilled Regard is in that 33 to 1 group right now. Uh, what are your thoughts on any of those? Um, I mean, I, I guess of the names you, 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 you popped out there, the ones I would be most interested in, but I think it still would be t- tough, would be um, Free Drop Billy and uh and uh catholic boy i think those are the two that 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 might get my attention unfortunately this game is tricky for me because i I just feel like if i'm not getting 50 to 1 on a derby future or higher like i just i I just don't i'm not really sure it's worth playing you know and that's the and um and and obviously you can get 33 to 1 on a horse like mckenzie or something weird like that or 33 to 1 on a horse like good magic or something like that um but I think that those two would be the ones that, that got my attention at 33 to one. Cause it feels like if they go on to win their preps or to win another couple of races, uh, draw favorably train, well, they will be shorter than that on the day. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's such a chaotic betting race. And there's so much, so many other factors that guide betting in the Derby that you can find, you can almost always find value. Uh, which is funny to say about a race that the favorites had such success in of late. But for vertical wagering particularly, I think it's true. I mentioned it still regard as much as anything just to see if you thought he had any excuse in the Risen Star. He was bet the 7-5, to five, a price at which I thought he was an okay bet, frankly. Um, ends up running fourth in there. was just curious if you had any uh, interest in him going forward. Um, no, not really. I mean, I wasn't crazy about it uh, going into Uh, real reason it just feel yeah i I, I still don't understand like to me on paper he just such was stand out in it when we talked it on friday too you were obviously enthused and you liked the principe uh more and i i didn't i never understood what was going in your head why you preferred that that one day yeah it's weird i mean like one of those things that like i you know there's a lot of reasons i like horses and i'll give you a ton of reasons why uh but he's just one that, that there's, I don't really have a strong reason. I, I just, some about him, I just don't, doesn't. It's okay. Them. You can be left cold. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I uh, you know, Prince of year may I could run better. And that was uh, a bit disappointing. But, uh, you know, I mean, in still regard, was a little bit right again. But I just, eh, I just there's something about him that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get me going. I think there's a fire drill in the hotel. I'm not even exaggerating. I hear a weird uh-huh. siren. <laughs> We're getting to the end of the show anyway. <laughs> you hear that in the background? I hear a little bit. That's maybe, maybe. we want to go check Susan and parents. We're going to wrap. We'll do a little more box sell hold later. Um, I want to thank Jonathan Kitchen. Thank everybody for listening. I want to thank uh, producer AJ for ably filling in. Pro- Willie Nile for providing our theme song. WillieNile.com for more of his music. Thank you to Trap Stone as well. We will be back uh, recorded, I believe, but we will be back on Friday. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. May you win all your photos.